Throughout this show, Alexis will courageously tell us about the tragic event that changed her life forever. Like most of us in high school, feelings of insecurity and peer pressure can cause us to make stupid choices. Alexis was no different. I was raised in Burbank by, uh, went to Burroughs High School in Burbank and I was on the swim team. I remember being really into uh, my practices and my schoolwork, um, but then I, uh, it got too much for me. I was 14 and I was introduced to alcohol. I, um, I took my chance to get drunk. I had a friend that was granted for the weekend and she wanted me to keep her company. And so the second her parents walked out the door, she asked me if I had ever gotten drunk. And I said no, and she said, well, that's what we're doing this weekend. And uh, she went to her dad's liquor cabinet and took out all her dad's liquor and lined them up on the bar. She made me take a shot of each bottle. All of a sudden, I just remember feeling like, oh God, this is amazing. I'm not worried <laughs> or scared anymore. And I'm having fun. That's where I really learned how to drink. You know, I was never taught to sip wine or anything like that. I was taught to get drunk as fast as possible. There was uh, two girls that I knew that hung out in the same group of friends that I did, and um, they were driving in the desert, and uh, their car hit a ditch, and it flipped, and they died. Um, at a very young age, at 16, uh, there was a few friends that I've had that have been pulled over by the police and they've gotten DUIs that way. And I had a friend hit a parked car once, leaving a party. I had a friend flip their car and um, almost die from it. All these things that had happened around me and had happened to my friends. I never personalized it. I never thought that um, it would be me. I never thought it would be me. Later in the show, we get some surprising answers from teens about how they deal with responsibility. But first, we'll revisit Alexis and her story. Even as her friends' lives were being affected by the use of alcohol, Alexis couldn't see that she was headed down the same path. Unfortunately, one bad decision changed not just her life, but the lives of perfect strangers. The night of the accident, I, um, you know, I was getting ready for my date, and I always had a glass of wine before I went out. My date, and me and his roommate, we all shared a drink um, before we left for the restaurant. And with sushi, I had sake. Uh, we walk outside the restaurant, and he asked me, uh, how would you like to go to that bar right across the street? I'm having fun on this date. Okay, why I don't want to end it. So, sure, okay. And we went and uh, we had a few more drinks there. So, uh, you know, at this point, I'm, you know, I'm feeling drunk and I'm thinking, okay, you know, I'm right down the street. I'm right, I'm, I don't live that far away. I can make it home okay. I feel okay. I feel fine. I can make it fine. And I get into my car, and I'm driving, and I'm thinking, okay, the worst that's going to happen right now is that I'm going to get pulled over and get a DUI. And then I'm driving, and I'm focusing on my speed limit. And um, while I'm focusing on my speed limit, I'm not looking at the road. And it starts to swerve, and it swerves. So right at that moment where it curves, there's another car that's coming down and I'm looking at my speedometer and it swerves and it hits this car that's coming. And all I know is that my airbags went off. Uh, my car started to do a 360. It started to spin around really fast. The car finally stopped. And uh, the way that I could describe it is basically just waking up into a nightmare. Immediately I knew that I had drank in on this date and I hit this man and uh, at that moment I just I think I just really wanted to crawl up in a hole and die you know I just really wanted to die so I told the policeman just arrest me this is completely my fault and so uh, he did the sobriety test um, and finally 
He told me to turn around and put my hands behind my back and I felt the handcuffs and then he started to read me my rights. And so they put me in the back of the police car and they started to take me to jail. And um, I'm sitting there in the back of the car and I'm realizing as I'm in the back of the car that my mom is waiting up for me at home because she never slept until I got home. And I'm, I'm starting to cry and I'm asking the police officers if he's okay. One of them looked back and finally said he's in critical condition. So I make my way to the Hollywood Division and they ask me if I want to take a breathalyzer or if I want to do a blood test and I don't know. I don't know anything. I've never been arrested before and uh, I blew a point one nine. I honestly, I didn't realize that that was double over the legal limit. That's how drunk I was. In my head, I felt like I was fine. They took my mug shot there, and, uh, and then they transferred me over to the Van Ice Jail. Tragic situations bring out who we truly are. You can either lay blame on others or take responsibility upon yourself. Selflessly, Alexis was able to accept the pain that she caused and prove that she was truly sorry by taking personal responsibility for her actions. So I went to court with my mom and we're waiting for my case to be called and meanwhile this woman goes and sits right next to my mom and um, this is his mother so it made this man more real seeing his mother right there. And I looked at her and thought about my own mom. But what do you say? You know, what do you say to a mother that has lost her son? And I'm the reason. I'm the reason why her son's not living anymore. Immediately I thought in my head, okay, I need to write, I need to write this woman a letter. I need her to know that this has completely changed me. You know, whatever happens, whatever the sentencing is, whatever it is, this has completely changed me and I have completely taken full responsibility of this. I need her to know that. And about two months had passed and my mom was talking to my attorney on the phone and told him that Alex wanted to give this letter to the mother. And he said, oh, this is so tragic. He said, uh, we just found out that um, she died in an accident and she was with three of her friends and she was hit by a driver under the influence. I felt like this was somehow my fault. This woman never got to read this letter, never got to know how I felt. And um, how can this happen? You know, how can this happen twice? The, the father of the man started to, uh, to attend the court hearings and seeing him for the first time was like seeing Bruce, was like making him more of a person. And in my head, I'm thinking, you know, if I could just, if I had that one chance just to go talk to him, tell him how sorry I am. With every decision made, there's a consequence. As we continue her story, Alexis tells us about life as an inmate in county jail. The judge wanted me to to go to a 90-day observation at CIW. It's a women's prison in Chino. Just the perception that I had before going in there and, and what I had was a very scary perception. And uh, my sister, my mom and my father drove me out to Chino where the prison is. My sister took it the hardest, you know, and I remember thinking when she was crying, hugging me, <laughs> You know, my mom didn't raise me for this to happen, and I can't believe this is happening right now. And so I go in there, and I'm greeted by the guards, and uh, and then they do the check. Um, they make you strip, and they make you um, bend over. They make sure that you're not hiding or smuggling anything, and it's, it's a very demoralizing um, process to go through. 
you know, it's just me. This is an experience that I'm going through alone. And, um, and I'm scared, you know, I'm terrified right now. I am terrified and then, and this is when it's real. You know, this is when it's real, okay? There's no guards around now. It's all inmates and, um, and it's loud. You know, it's constantly loud. It's never quiet in prison. And so I started to really learn about the prison culture in there and, um, and how things were run in there. You know, the first night was extremely hard. I started to cry. Um, and that's when I, you know, that's when I really realized that you know, this could be a long time. I could be in here for a long time. There's things that I took for granted was, you know, like sleeping in a regular bed, um, having a regular pillow. They don't give you pillows in there, they give you a blanket, and that's it. Um, books, things like that, talking to my family, hugging my mom. Um, those are things that I took for granted that you don't get in prison. And, um, and so, as the days went on, it got harder and harder. And at uh, 77 days, I was released, and um, and they just said, "Okay, you're going." And they let me out the gate, and I remember seeing my mom just standing there, and um, you know, I ran up to her so fast, and I gave her the hugest hug. Through everything that has happened, Alexis has been determined to use her life as a message to teens. For the past five years, Alexis has been talking to teens about how easily things can get out of control, how lives can be lost, and what it's like to live knowing another family is living without. Having two strikes is always knowing that if I ever happen to get in trouble again, that I know that I could go away for life in prison, that I could spend the rest of my life in prison if I get in trouble for anything, anything at all. So. The reason why I stay sober today, people that get drunk do stupid things. They hang out with people that, that do things and I'm sure that if me just being there, I could get in trouble. To spend the rest of my life in prison, I mean, just being in there, it's just so painful. It's like, okay, you just bought your ticket to hell, except you're alive for the rest of your life knowing you're never going to get out and see your family. You're never gonna be able to have your freedom again, ever again. What is your message to teens about alcohol, drinking, and driving? My message would be for anyone, including teens, to get a designated driver when they're going out or when they're planning to have any type of alcohol or even smoking weed or anything like that being intoxicated or impaired to always plan to have a designated driver or to have someone that they can always call and it doesn't matter how late it is. I think the problem that most people have is asking for help and uh, being too embarrassed to call somebody and ask them for help and um, anything can happen and most people think that it can't happen to them but it can happen to you. It can happen to anybody.